for this session, uh, I wanted to take the opportunity to, to introduce the International Law R Research Program um, at CG. Uh, the, this program, the Summer Institute, is um, co-sponsored um, by CG through their International Law Research Program. Uh, and it's a really fascinating uh, program and uh, Una can, can, can speak to this, but by my estimation, I think it probably has to be the single largest investment in international legal research ever. And, you know, maybe in some cumulative way, the Max Planck Institute or something has put, but, you know, as a sort of single defined research initiative, it's really, really unparalleled um, um, globally. And so uh, we've invited the, the, the director of the research uh, program, uh, Una Fitzgerald, and I'm going to ask her a few questions, and then, you know, we'll give you sort of a, a bit of an opportunity to sort of understand what they're up to and, and how it connects uh, to, to what, uh, uh, what we're doing. Um, Una's really interestingly placed um, to be the director of this, this program. Uh, she is a, a long-time um, survivor of the Canadian federal federal government, and as, as, as held, I think I, I met Una, I don't know, I'm trying to think, 10 years ago maybe when she was leading a project for the Department of Justice on international law um, there, and, um, and she's held uh, numerous um, um, very sort of high-ranking posts uh, within, within justice and, and, and various... Uh, um, client uh, uh, departments, including, uh, I think you were the head legal advisor for the Department of National, National Defense and the Forces. You're the chief legal counsel for the public law sector of the Department of Justice uh, and held a number of, uh, of uh, posts in relation to the cabinet and legislature. Uh, but she also has a PhD in international law um, and so, and has um, edited and published books on, on international law. So she brings both a kind of researcher's uh, viewpoint, but also I think a sort of governmental practitioner's viewpoint to, to, um, to international law. And so um, we've been hearing sort of rumblings about international law around CG for some time in this program. And uh, when they announced the, 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 the director, it didn't, it didn't uh, um, surprise me um, um, that, that, that it, was, it, it was Una. Um, and so I thought I'd just um, perhaps start by asking you um, a little bit about um, how, how, how you came to this and, um, and um, well, I'll just leave it uh, at, at that. Okay. Thanks very much for the introduction, Neil. And Hello to everybody. It's great to see you all here. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see the, this project um, live um, in existence. So I came to CG a year ago uh, in April as the new director of the International Law Research Program. And as Neil says, my background really was predominantly government, but also doing academic work as in the evenings <laughs> as sort of a side activity uh, because I just found the issues I was dealing with at work were so interesting that I had to think about them in a more um, you know, academic way as well as the doing that you do in government. And I think the, the one thing you really notice um, in a long career in government is how interconnected issues are. So I started off doing a lot, well, I actually started off in criminal law, um, but then, and criminal law reform, but I quickly got into issues of refugees, um, human rights, and constitutional law, and that led me into international law. So all those areas get quite connected. Um, and I ended up be becoming a, a manager and a, a leader of large groups. But some of the interesting issues that I had to deal with were issues that really were unprecedented and forced people to try and figure out, well, where's the answer? It's not in a book. It's not, it's not easily uh, found by just you know, calling somebody who's got the title, uh, the problem in their title. It, it doesn't exist like that. You really have to solve the problem. So a really big example of that was when the events of 9-11 happened. There wasn't a department of um, anti-terrorism. There wasn't a department to answer the really weird questions that were coming up about, is this, um, is this an, act of war or is this an act of 
international, is this criminal law? What is this event that has just happened in New York and Washington? So, um, you know, that was just a, one of those cases where people had to kind of look at what was going on and then think, how do we solve this problem? How do we answer the questions that are going to come forward? And there were so many questions people had. So um, there wasn't even a cabinet uh, committee that was, would deal with these issues. So you didn't have you didn't have senior officials or senior, uh, the ministers themselves, organized to address these issues. So we started feeding advice up and realized you had to create a cabinet committee to deal with public safety and anti-terrorism, so they created a committee. Then the UN Security Council um, passed a resolution very quickly after those events, basically calling on all, depart all governments around the world to look at their laws and make sure they had sufficient laws to address terrorist acts, that they had sufficient laws to uh, trace money and collaborate on terrorist financing, addressing the challenge of terrorist financing, and that they would also um, ensure that they could cooperate with each other in solving international terrorism, and that they then had to report back to the UN Security Council very quickly. I can't remember, it was a few weeks or a few months anyway. So that was the international community basically ordering each state to come up with international law that would solve this issue. So um, anyway, that's just one example of unprecedented. And there were many others. Um, one that, that uh, may seem a long time ago now, but there was the issue of a reference that went to the Supreme Court about unilateral secession by Quebec. And so that was a case that was being decided by the highest court of the land, but it dealt with the most interesting international law issues you could imagine. Uh, so working on that file was, was quite interesting. Um, there were many other files in different areas, um, environmental issues that come up. You know, when a Canadian company finds itself in environmental uh, in trouble with environmental laws in the U.S., what does Canada do? How do you, how do we deal with that mediation between the two countries? Or there was a very strange case we had where, I don't know if you've ever heard of a place called Devil's Lake, but Devil's Lake was this nasty little lake um, that was in the Mississippi watershed, but was, was threatening to break its banks, I believe, and it was going to spread into the Hudson Bay watershed. So the pollution and all the um, environmental issues around mixing the two watersheds were were at stake in that case. We had to figure out a solution involving the provinces, the states, and the governments. And you, you know, it it's, can be quite interesting and complicated trying to figure those things out. So I think the conclusion um, that I, from my career in um, the federal government was that international law is truly interesting. It's really evolving. Um, the project that Neil mentioned, uh, uh, which we did on with academics and public lawyers about you know, what are the pressing issues in international law? Um, that's a good in illustration of how international law is changing. The, the issue that people came up with as the most pressing was the relationship between international law and domestic law. They were, the academics were um, really perplexed by how poorly the courts were understanding international law, uh, how poorly politicians understood it, how poorly even the you know, lawyers within the Department of Justice understood international law. So we thought it'd be really useful to try and explain how international law works at the international level and how do you bring international law into domestic law so that it has some impact in Canada through passing legislation usually. But anyway, so that was an example of international law um, evolving. So we were seeing that it was becoming more and more relevant to ordinary practice. So it didn't matter what department you worked in, in the federal government, you would be touching on some international law issues. And I'm sure in, uh, well, if you were studying law right now, any course you took, whether it was criminal law, as you heard today, um, intellectual property law, environmental law, you'd find there'd be some part of the course where you have to start talking about international law. So it's just become much more predominant in the world. And um, as it's become more predominant, we're also realizing that a lot of the international law that has been written has been developed by the West. And there are more and more people asking to have a place in international law and to, um, to sort of shape international law as well. So countries like China um, have a real interest in shaping international law and countries, um, you know, the, the BRIC countries, and also um, different groups such as indigenous peoples and women, as we heard in the noon hour presentation. So 
International law is changing. That's why I'm interested in it. Um, maybe I'll just pick up on a couple of those those themes because I think they r relate to the st sort of structure of the of the research program um, it, it, itself. And so uh, I was introduced to the research program because I was in, you know invited by you to uh, to a meeting when when you were setting up the the program, and there was a a real um, diversity of, of, of people in the room. There were Supreme Court justices, there were government lawyers, there were lots of private lawyers, uh, lots, of, lots of academics. And uh, from that perspective, I'm just wondering how, how you and the, and the research program are really sort of conceiving about international law. So when you're embarking on a project of this magnitude, looking at um, sort of broad-based research in international law, um, did you come to it with a sort of particular view on how broadly you're going to look and the kind of constituents that, that you were interested in, in reaching out to in the project? Um, it's a good question. I, the constituents, I think, were partially as a result of this being in a think tank. And you think, who are the kinds of people you deal with if you are in a think tank? You want to do relevant research, but it has to be a high quality research. So that really means that you, you can't, um, you can't have just sort of one focus. It's really important to know what's happening at local government, uh, national government, um, international governmental bodies. It's really important to know what the uh, NGO community is doing in a particular issue, in relation to a particular issue. And it's really important to know what's the cutting edge thinking in the academic community as well. And finally, in the practice of law, um, a lot of the cutting edge work happens in litigation. So you also have to talk to the practitioners, see what's going on in practice. Um, and so, yeah, it was really good to have quite a mix of people attending, attending our, um, our workshop. And in terms of the, the topics that we were looking at, um, you're right, it was very broad, broad ranging. And um, when I, as soon as I came in, I thought the first thing I needed to do was to really consult and find out what did people think were the, the, the important issues, where we could add some sort of value that would be different from what governments are doing, or universities, um, or private practitioners. Uh, so I consulted quite broadly, uh, phone calls just to everyone I knew and people I knew, somebody who knew them, um, to find out what they thought. And we ended up with this list of about 50 issues, mostly centered around three topics that had been identified in the agreement with the province, which is one of our, our funders. Um, and those areas were economic law, environmental law, and intellectual property. And then we thought, oh, should we do separate sessions on these topics, or should we kind of mix it up and get everybody in the room to comment on all of them? And that's what we ended up doing, which made a very lively discussion um, and brought out all the links between environmental law and economic law, economic law and intellectual property law, intellectual property and environmental law, and also the sort of issues that that cut across them all, such as the rights of indigenous people, um, issues around development, et cetera. It's, so, so one of the things that, that really um, s struck me as a, if I was, if I was in your shoes, is just the, the, the huge challenge of actually deciding how you're going to focus the, focus the research, because you have, you know, even, if you identify these three sub areas, each of those areas are are, are, are huge areas in and of them, in and of themselves. And and I know you've you've had lots of interesting consultations. So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the process of uh, which I think is continuing of how you're sort of narrowing down and identifying particular research projects um, and 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 then how you sort of move to the implementation phase of the of the program. Um, Okay, so after we did this first consultation, we were able to narrow down the topics to uh, three, the three big areas. Because one of the messages we got was, you don't need to do all of international law. You know, that's really, the universities will do that, they'll continue teaching that. Just focus on the three, you've got enough there. And as, as uh, uh, Neil is saying, it, it was huge, the amount of work to do. So focusing on the three, we then narrowed it down to about three or four topics in each. And we thought, let's start with those, because the discussion seemed to really target those three or four topics. And then, 
Um, we then proceeded to have very focused uh, consultation workshops with experts in those fields. So th then we were really looking into that sp specific topic. So we did, um, um, we've done three so far in economic law, and each of the economic law subjects is very distinct. So one on sovereign debt issues and cross-border insolvency. Well, you know, obviously you just don't invite everybody to a meeting like that. There's only some people who even know what the heck the topic is about. So we managed to get a, a pretty small group of people together that became the core of a working group, and they figured out like what are the areas we have to look at, where um, where can we have some impact. So the first thing we saw was the um, Financial Stability Board was seeking input on um, you know what are the best approaches to reform the um, uh, approaches to addressing sovereign debt restructuring, and so we were able to write a submission on that. Uh, feed that into the FSB and immediately make ourselves somewhat relevant by doing that, you know, and plus we'd sort of consolidated a working group. And then from there we've been doing other events that um, allow us to bring our research from, you know, experienced academics to some practical um, application. Um, we did a workshop on investment and trade uh, and out of that we've got a few major projects. One huge one on the issue of investor state dispute between developed democracies, uh, Amand Demetra, we'll probably talk more about that, and a couple of other ones, one on NAFTA at 20, et cetera. Um, we just did a workshop on the global, uh, on international and transnational regulation of global value chains and corporate social responsibility. So that was an opportunity to meet with people who'd expressed interest in this topic, see who would be willing to work with us, and now we'll be putting together projects in that area. Neil attended a, an event we did in February, which was on climate change, and we had a really interesting group there, academics, people who are really practicing in this area, whether they were working for government um, or you know municipal governments or in private practice. And out of that, we came up with a fairly um, detailed research pro program, as well as a strategy for moving forward to have impact over the next, uh, this year in particular, you know, get, raising awareness about the, the um, uh, climate change and the UN triple C process, um, and also preparing policy recommendations for that. So that, that was a very useful meeting. And so basically we hold these meetings. I think we have now done all of them, except for one that's coming up um, at the end of the month on the extractive industry, industry and indigenous peoples. Um, we did one on biodiversity and traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expression. And that really pointed out this issue about how international law means so many different things to different people. And, uh, you know, how when you start talking about global rule of law, you really have to uh, have a big imagination to encompass all the ideas. <laughs> um, just picking up on that notion of sort of global r rule of law, is. Is there a sort of a broader normative framing? Like, if, if you're looking at this project, what's going to define success um, for you and for, and for CG in terms of, uh, um, you know, <laughs> academics define success in one way. I don't think it's the way necessarily that think tanks define um, success. And I'm just wondering, again, if you've, if you've thought about that in both outputs but also in sort of normative terms. Yeah, well, the I guess the normative frame is provided by the uh, um, the missions values of CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation. So it talks about how um, you know the overall objective is to increase sustainability, prosperity, and human rights. So you know if our projects don't have that as an ultimate goal, <laughs> there's there's something wrong with them. Um, but we also are framed by where we sit. So we are part of this community in Waterloo, uh, you know, with the Balsilli School next door, with the two universities in this environment, with Communitech, which is a, um, an innovation hub, hub down the, the road um, in Kitchener. And we're funded by the province and by um, Jim Balsilli, who's, who um, is the, he funds half of our program. So um, what we try to do is we try to do projects that are relevant in the community, in the province, nationally and internationally. So we always see it as 
sort of like concentric circles of influence that we want to have. Not all our projects are so rooted in the community as, say, our, um, our clinic that we do for inter international intellectual property law. So we run a clinic with Communitech. That's a really good local project. I guess this is a local project, uh, really grounded here. Um, we give scholarships to graduate law students doing doctorates across Canada or masters across Canada. Um, so that's another way of being you know, grounded in, in local community in, in Canada. But we also, um, we've explained to the province and uh, to everyone who's interested that you can't do international law in isolation. You, the way to do it at an excellent level is to make networks everywhere. So we're building net networks around the world. Uh, you know, so we have an MOU with the World Trade Institute in Bern, Switzerland. Uh, we work with the International Insolvency Institute, uh, the American Society of International Law, et cetera. So we're trying to build networks everywhere. So uh, have there been any surprises? I'm sure there's been lots, but um, what, uh, what aspects of this uh, process so far have, have really turned out a little bit different than, than when, you, when you came here a year ago? Um, I'm not so sure that there have been that many surprises. Um, I suppose one thing has been getting used to the way things work here at CG, and that's been very interesting, actually, because there's so much support you get from the publications group and from the um, events people. So you can have an idea, and um, you, know, you do have to give people a little bit of notice, but they will put together these wonderful events. And so that has been a pleasant and amazing surprise to see. Um, it, it's not, well, one of the issues I had was we thought that we would be bringing in mostly researchers who would work out of Waterloo. And that's actually been a bit more difficult to do just because people tend to be at some point in their career, most of them don't find it that easy to move for short periods of time, unless they're on a sabbatical, in which case it works quite well or if they're postdocs, in which case they're usually quite mobile and they're happy to come to a research center and start building their CV. So we're fine. So that was a bit of a, um, a realization that it would be not so easy to get that many full-time senior fellows here. But what we found was that this has turned out to be a great advantage because it means, you know, instead of having full-time people, we can have many more part-time people working for us all around the world. So uh, that's been an interesting development. Um, we also have an advisory committee that, um, that is made up of uh, very eminent practitioners and academics in international law. And they help uh, shape our strategy. And that's, that's been really useful to sort of bounce ideas off them and, and get their guidance. And, and maybe just because we have a, a room full of, of, of students, um, is how's the program, um, other than the, the Summer Institute, interacting with students? Are there opportunities for, for, for student uh, research? How do you see that um, moving forward? And how are you interacting sort of more broadly with the sort of global governance um, research community? Uh, uh, a lot of our research tends towards being multidisciplinary. And a lot of people, uh, you know, in, in our consultation workshops, they often talk about things like efficacy. And lawyers are great at, you know, analyzing laws and drafting laws, but efficacy is a bit more of a challenge for somebody with a legal training. So there's been a lot of interest in getting help from either the other programs at CG, the Global Economy Program, or the Global Security and Policy Program, as well as people in the local community, you know, the two universities and both Silly School, to help with um, looking at issues from different perspectives. So, for example, I know that, um, you know, one of our senior fellows was very interested in working with um, a doctoral student in economics, if he could find one that you know, would work with his particular project. So I think there are opportunities. Um, I guess we have to figure out ways to connect people who want to work on these things. We, we have a summer student right now who's, um, it's probably more junior level than some of the people here, but who's, who's helping us out on, um, as an intern. And so yeah, there are definitely opportunities. Okay. Um, do any of you guys have any questions?
Um, maybe I could mention one other thing. Sure. Uh, I don't know if during the lunch today you had an opportunity to meet many of the grad students that are upstairs on the third floor, but they, they, you know, they were invited to the lunch uh, presentation as well. And they're doing their doctorates and masters in law, but um, they would be quite useful to interact with, and I'm sure they would be interested in interacting with you, just because of that opportunity to you know, cross fields of, of research. So they'll be at the reception, I think, today. Yeah, and I, the other people that you wouldn't recognize would have been lots of Balsili faculty as well. Yeah, so yeah. Um, there's um, so take the opportunity during the lunch hours to 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 talk with them as well for sure. Uh, hello, thank you, and I apologize to my peers. I, I've been taking a lot of airspace, but uh, <laughs> I was wondering. It's come up in a few conferences, and it's really like it preoccupies a lot of. Uh, the political science department, um, you know, kind of theorists, uh, the academics is we're in an age where the government is so open to actually have scholars come in and talk about policy issues. I heard about an initiative called Fast Talk in the federal bureaucracy where they invite a lunch and then they do this debrief and, uh, you know, on policy briefs they invite experts. And I guess I'm just leading towards... Um, what role do you see this school, but also in general other schools, in being a, a vanguard or a, a, a cr like critics of the government, rather than there's there's kind of this embedded institutional symbi like symbiotic relationship with funding, and I'm just wondering that uh, what do you see the future role of research institutes to, you know, kind of keeping an honest check, uh, speaking truth to power. Question in there for both of us, but uh, <laughs> okay, I can make a few comments about from a CG point of view. So CG is a an independent think tank. It's supposed to be. It is non-aligned, and we do get funding from different sources. My program in particular doesn't get any federal funding, but other programs do. Um, obviously. Um, why do governments fund institutes like this? I think one of the reasons is that it's harder and harder to staff positions uh, for policy research in government. They're so much focused on what the particular issue is they're dealing with. They don't have the opportunity to really get in-depth policy work done within the organization. So, um, you know, we invite government people to all of our our uh, workshops and they and we do them under Chatham House rules so that allows everyone to talk frankly and and have a really good exchange um, but there's you know and there is that freedom that they can say things and it won't be reported out um, as you know so and so said it and and that works really well because what I, I see is that they really need institutes like this to do the work they can't do. And I've, the reaction I've had from academics for our program, you know, once they understand it, is they also find it's great that there is an institute like this because they also don't have time. They're busy, well, they're doing the things that academics have to do, which is their publications and their teaching, as well as their administration. But um, they don't really have time necessarily to engage in policy relevant work. And that's something that we can help with. We can start connecting people. So it's, it's the ability of a think tank to sort of convene people that um, puts us in a different place. And uh, a part of the convening is, is being proving that you are independent and you're treated all the parties around the table with respect. And therefore, they, they want to come to those meetings because they know they'll get something out of it. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, from my perspective, I, I think when you're in that role, it's it's a very much a learned s skill that government policymakers require certain kinds of input that's actually different than the kind of work that a lot of academic researchers do. Uh, and you can really fall flat when you go up and talk to a bunch of government people and deliver an academic paper. And so I think part of it is actually learning how to talk to government um, people um, and how to listen to government um, people uh, in, order, in order to be effective. If you can do that well, 
Um, I mean, th there are times and on certain issues where the government really wants, I mean, I, I, I've been working on climate change and it's been, you know, it's been quite hard to engage the federal government on, 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 on climate change until, until, quite, until quite recently. Um, but, um, and so you have to find different, different ways. So I think that sort of permeability, um, I mean, certainly I think that permeability is a very good thing, and I think there's a lots of people in government that would like to see more permeability. There's a, a surprising number of barriers, I would say, to that. It sounds really easy. Why wouldn't you? Oh, there's a bunch of, you know, smart students and researchers out there doing work that the government would be interested in. But there seems to be, uh, I think, s significant barriers. Um, some on the government side, but a lot of them on the academic side as, as well. And I think understanding um, how governments work and that kind of information is a, is, is a key part. So I would say if you're a sort of a policy student, um, um, pay a lot of attention <laughs> to the questions and what perks up um, the attention of of the government, because it's it, it at least in my experience, it's always things that I I, I never an, anticipated what they're actually interested in. Um, and I guess the other thing, um, <laughs> looking around the room, is it gets harder for people to move as they get more advanced in their careers and they're more vested in particular you know endeavors that they're involved in, and so it's it is really good, sort of as you finish your grad work or as you're completing it to think about, you know, to take some risks because it just will be harder to take them later. And everybody wants this exchange between government, academia, um, you know, the stakeholder groups, et cetera. But unless you do it, it won't happen, you know? It's, it really is an individual choice that people have to make. And um, a lot of people just don't make that choice. They decide to go one route and stay in it. So, you know, you can't really blame government for that. It's, it's the individuals each time. So I mean, I think Val had a, there was a little bit of, if you picked up on that little bit of serendipity in, in, in her talk, where she said, you know, as a graduate student, she just got an invitation to go in, to go and do something, and there was some resistance, you know, well, is that really a good idea? It's going to delay your thesis. Um, and, but it all, very clearly, it, um, it, it put her in a, in a position, you know, not only to be impactful, but also um, to to become a much better scholar because you know the the stuff that she's uh, interested in as a researcher was you know she had a, a front row seat to so you know I think um, and I um, I think both you know Sarah and I were remarking after that we both had have had similar experiences and uh, so uh, I think being I guess alive to those possibilities. Uh, and I think there's a huge amount of receptivity um, that students, graduate students in particular, um, don't take advantage of. I think if you phone people in government and say, hey, I'm doing this really interesting project um, that's relevant to you, you know, it's free research, they are interested, it's a really good entree to, to go and meet people. And if it is actually really good and useful research, um, and you know, just, in, in, as it seemed in, in Val's case, they said, well, we need someone to do this. Oh, I know this, you know, this really smart person. And so again, I think if you're, and, and you know, and I think just to bring it back to the ILRP, I think there's, um, um, you know, in my short interactions with it, um, you know, we've been able to be put in the room with the, you know, climate negotiators and, um, uh, all sorts of really interesting people in both the public and private sector, and I think CG's ability to actually convene people is is, is really attractive um, uh, as a researcher. In that um, they have uh, an incredible ability to bring people into a room um, that, as a researcher, you're, you're tend to be interested in talking to. Um, when we do um, a consultation workshop, we we often include grad students in that. So if we were aware that, you know, you were working on a topic that was particularly relevant to our research, that would be a possibility that you'd get involved in the meeting. And then, yeah, you're, you're rubbing shoulders with some really interesting people. You're having an opportunity to um, even, you know, maybe make a presentation if you've got a particularly relevant topic. And uh, that can be an amazing start to further relationships. 
So maybe I, I promised everyone that I'd try to get, uh, you know, to give everyone a little bit of time uh, before the reception. So let me just, uh, I think uh, Una's on a, you're on a plane to, to Bonn for more climate negotiations. <laughs> and uh, so she won't be able to join us for the rest of the, uh, of the week. But I'm uh, really pleased that you were able to, 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 to join us now and, uh, and obviously really pleased of um, the CG's um, willingness to to help us put this program to well, help us to really lead this the, 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 this program. Uh, so thank you. And uh. well, um, it's been a pleasure. And you know, one of going, just going back to the point about how we situate ourselves and where we come from in the international law research program. You know, because we see ourselves as having to promote international law and understanding of international law. This seemed like such a logical thing to do when, when Neil uh, presented the proposition to us and, and John Ravenhill, that um, you know, to talk to people who are researching, or adva doing advanced research in related topics, but would like a bit of um, deeper understanding of how international law works, we just thought it would be um, a great idea to try this out. So uh, congratulations on being that first group that is in this experiment. And of course, we'll be very interested to get your feedback as to uh, if it's useful. Um, you will not get a law degree at the end of this. <laughs> but I'll be curious to know how many of you decide to go on to legal studies. <laughs> Or not. <laughs> or not. So, uh, so, okay, well, thank you, and we'll, we'll see everyone in half an hour. <laughs>